Uh, two world. weeks ago, he's on the beach. Yeah. He's not on the beach now, bitch. Yeah. Okay, so like. <laughs> The first gun that was ever really mine was a Remington 870 Wingmaster in 20 gauge. I set aside all my chore money in a massive pickle jar and when I finally had enough, my parents took me to Walmart and bought it for me when I was 12 years old. I loved that shotgun so much that I almost didn't care when the ATF took my mom to federal prison for buying a firearm for a child. But I got to learn how to shoot a shotgun on an American classic and my mom got to learn how to make toilet hooch. So wins all around. Over the years, obviously, I bought more and more shotguns. Of course, I became a Remington groupie because it's kind of like if your first car is a Ford, it isn't like you go out and start buying Chevys down the road, especially if you had a great experience with that first car. So over that time, I bought a number of 870s, including a Remington 870 Police SBS that I've had for years. And when I finally decided that it was time to get into the more expensive semi-automatic shotgun game, I got the Remington 1187 Police as well. But as you all know, Remington started getting passed around like a Wuhan made viral infection and eventually went out of business. I've always respected the shotgun. Sure, it's low capacity, but if you can't solve a problem with a 12 gauge, the problem can't be solved. Accordingly, I bought some pretty cool shotguns over the years, including the IWI TS-12, the Molot Vepper 12, both of which are outstanding semi-automatic shotguns. But as relatively common among gun buyers, I got virtually no formal training with a shotgun. Shotguns are the worst about that. It's one of those things where you're so used to handling them in your youth, around the farm or whatever, and the fact that shotguns aren't necessarily precise, long-range firearms. It's easy to think, well, I used to do dove hunting or whatever as a kid, so I don't need formal shotgun training. I've been around shotguns all my life. That couldn't be more incorrect. Sure, it's not rocket surgery to pull the trigger on a shotgun and make decent hits with it, but what I learned at the Thunder Ranch Combat Shotgun course is that setting up and manipulating a shotgun is much, much more difficult than doing the same thing with a handgun or a rifle. As Clint Smith points out in Combat Shotgun, the main issue with a shotgun is capacity. Lower capacity means more manipulation. And I'm going to do a clinical video about what I learned from that class a little bit later down the road. So if you're not shooting your shotgun, then you're feeding your shotgun. Derivatively, this means that your shotgun setup needs to be organized in such a way that ammo capacity and reloadability are just as important as accuracy or rate of fire, if not more so. So we're going to talk about the loadout that I used for this Beretta 1301 at the Thunder Ranch Combat Shotgun course. If you're into the 1301, check out my thousand round review of the gun that I did a few weeks back. I'll try to remember to post a card here. In today's video, I'm going to tell you about my gear, what it was, and why I got it. We're going to tackle these by order of importance, and I would say perhaps the most important thing for a shotgun is capacity. The 1301 comes with a standard 5 plus 1 round capacity, which is, I guess, not bad. However, I consider the Nordic Components Plus 2 to be a mandatory addition. It's well made, it's easy to install, it's a little bit pricey, and as I mentioned in my review video, I had to pay over MSRP for one of these because they're in short supply right now. But not only does it add two rounds to your overall capacity, but you get a little bit of Picatinny rail over here for adding a light, which is a very important element and you also get a QD sling socket on this side of the gun. Oh, and I say this side. You can change it if you're a lefty. In terms of price to performance, the return on investment is huge here. I think 150, 200 bucks, your capacity is increased by a third, you've got the ability to add a light, the ability to have at least one sling QD socket, and as you'll see if you watched our Blue Force Gear sling video, having a QD connection is really important. Plus, it just kind of looks cool, doesn't it? And that makes it 10 to 15% more effective. Frequently, a popular upgrade for a shotgun is a side saddle, but after a considerable amount of research with experts and talking about the subject, I'm gonna make a bold statement that the classic side saddle as we know it is no longer worth having. TFB TV is a democracy, not a dictatorship. So if you disagree with me, tell me why in the comments. But in the meantime, hear out my rationale. And that rationale is shotgun cards. 
I am really excited about this. I mean, super stoked to tell you guys because you all asked me a lot of questions about these and I'm just ready to go absolutely bananas on this subject. Okay, so what's the point of having any side saddle? Well, it helps with reloadability. You've got additional rounds as close as possible to your loading gate and to your ejection port. So combat loading and administrative loading becomes quicker and easier. But what happens when your side saddle goes empty? Now, not only are you worried about keeping your gun wet, but you've also got to top off your side saddle too. Shotgun cards fix that problem. They're cheaper and they're easier to install. They have no downside other than they wear out after a while and then you buy another one for like seven bucks. And if you're using these, okay, I don't leave them loaded. Like in other words, if you got 10, uh, like have two loaded, okay, one on your gun, one wherever else you want it, okay, and then have the other ones at rest because the elastic dies. That's the only problem with it. But that said, they're not that expensive. So buy a hundred of them, quit being a bitch, okay? You know, like load the things up and have some that you have put back so you're good to go there. So a shotgun cart is basically just a reinforced nylon placard with shotgun loops. There's a lot of them out there, but the ones that I got are from STAC. That's E-S-S-T-A-C. I also went and I got some Velcro brand industrial Velcro tape from Amazon. I'll drop a link in the description for this exact stuff because it was the perfect size. It worked flawlessly even during a brutal 1,000 round burndown. So I would get this exact same stuff. And as you can see, the size is like perfect right off the roll. So I kind of measured out the receiver and then I cut the loop side of the Velcro so it would perfectly accommodate, as it turns out, a seven round card. And as I'll mention in a second, the seven round card is a magic number. I ordered a bunch of these cards, it was fun. I got them in a bunch of different colors, but I mostly got multicam. And according to STAC, the multicam are made to mil spec. I don't know what that means at all, if they're better or if they're worse, but anytime I hear mil spec, I get a big old tactical chub because I picture tier one operators silently nodding in approval of my purchase. But seriously, I'm assuming it means mil specs probably better. The cards in the Velcro, they showed up. I cut the loop side of the Velcro to fit in the left side of my receiver. I also cut about the same length of Velcro loop and I stuck it to the right side of the buttstock. I picked the right side of the buttstock because I'm right-handed and that means my face is on the left side of the buttstock. It seemed more practical to not rake an entire sleeve of 12 gauge along my face when I shoot, so right side. It's a good idea to toy with the placement of this Velcro loop so your cards are in a place where they're not going to interfere and where they're going to be easy to access for violin loading. Violin loading, that is like I have the gun here turned on its left hand side and I've got the buttstock sitting on top of my shoulder. I interviewed Jess, a Thunder Ranch instructor, and she explained how she liked to set up her cards and whether or not she would go brass up or brass down. So um, there's different configurations depending on how you want to load it. Uh, I like to do actually a couple up with the rounds facing up for an easy grab, drop in kind of situation, or I do rounds lower like this for a grab and insert into here. Because this is a little bit larger gun for me, a little bit heavier, I like to violin load this. So it's actually, you're putting the stock up on your shoulder. You're getting a nice solid point of contact. This is nice and tight. This is up on my shoulder. It's not moving or sliding. So I get it here. When I wanna load, I can grab from here and I can either drop in or I can load from the bottom. Or if you have it the other direction, if your card is tight enough that these rounds are not going to fall off when it's upright, as long as it does not fall out, then this obviously sometimes is easier. And you can also then also just come from this one um, and reload. It, you really got to try it and figure out what works. Um, obviously, the cards make a difference. If they start to get too loose, throw them away, get a new one. I think this is the setup, like the way that that we kind of set this up before we started the course. I think it was perfect. Yeah. Just like the instruction I got yesterday. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you get the gist. That's a beautiful thing about it. Shotgun cards are simply better than side saddles because they're cheaper, they're easier to install, and guess what? When one of your cards goes dry, you simply rip it off and then smack a new loaded one on there and you're done. That's just not an option with a traditional side saddle. Some people might be worried about retention, like can these things actually hold shells in place? An elastic shotgun card will hold shells just as well, if not better, 
than a hard side saddle. I mean, look at this B-roll right here. I'm shaking these shotgun cards like a screaming baby and nothing is happening. So that all said, I now have seven plus one rounds in my shotgun. I've got 14 rounds stuck to the shotgun. So anytime I grab this gun and I'm running around with it, I got a full gun and two reloads just on my shotgun alone. But there's more. Remember how I mentioned that the seven round shotgun card is the ticket? That's because the seven round shotgun card when it's completely loaded is pretty much the exact same size as an AR-15 magazine. I mean, do I have to spell out why that's so awesome? That means that any soft gear that you have that will accommodate an AR-15 magazine will also accommodate these seven round shotgun cards perfectly. You guys know I'm a big fan of minimalist chest rigs. I've got a bunch of them. I know I need to do a video on all my chest rigs and which ones I like soon. But for this course, I did some shopping around to see if there was such a thing as a five cell chest rig, like five magazines. Turns out there is. I got a Whiskey 2-4 <clears throat> Pimps system. And despite the cringe name, which by the way, high school James Reeves called and he wants his favorite adjective, noun, and verb back, it holds five cells, it's really well made, and so that means I can strap 35 shotgun shells to my chest. It didn't feel cumbersome at all. It's like it wasn't even there. My only complaint is that it didn't come with any strap keepers. So if you had any excess strappage hanging off your back, it's just flopping around back there, but that's not a big deal. Fix it with electrical tape or spend a couple bucks on Velcro keepers or something like that. So with a five mag system plus the cards on my gun, I'm rolling around with 57 shotgun shells that are rapidly deployable. As your cards go dry in your gun, you peel it off, you take one out of your chest rig, stick it on there, that easy. I also brought a Spiritus fanny pack with me, and I think a fanny pack is the best way to store loose shells. I let Johnny B use it so he could taste the superiority of the F-Pack tactical reload. You can drop a couple sleeves of loose 12 gauge into a fanny pack. But why would you have loose 12 gauge when you have all these neato cards, you ask? Well, sometimes your gun and your cards that are on it will both go dry. And you just need to get back in the game quickly, get like a shot or two off. It's faster to grab a couple of shells from your fanny pack, do a combat load, maybe jam one in the tube. It's faster to do that than it is to rip off one of your cards, take one off, stick it on there, take a round out of there, put it in there, load it up, get it ready to go. So it's nice to have at least a few loose rounds. Another tip, you can also keep two different types of rounds in your pack, like you can keep loose buckshot, and then you can use, especially if you've got Velcro loop interior on your fanny pack, you can use another shotgun card in there and keep your slugs in it. So that way you'll be able to tell the difference between the loose buckshot and the slugs in the card without even looking. So to me, this was kind of the big secret of the whole thing. And like I said before, I started going off in this rant about shotgun cards. You're going to have a very hard time convincing me as to why I should ever buy a hard side saddle again. <sighs> Going to take a couple of deep breaths, calm down, and talk about the other items on my loadout now that we got the shotgun card thing out of the way. A sling is, of course, critical. Many of you who have been watching this channel know that for years I've considered Blue Force gear to be the best of the best, especially the padded Vickers sling, which is what I have on here. Shotgun course was no exception, and the Multicam Tropic looked as good as it functioned with my OD Green shotgun. And if you fit it appropriately, yeah, we did a video about that, it's easy to tighten, loosen, maneuver in and out of it. I was swimming in it, I was swimming out of it, I was like a tactical Michael Phelps, except sexier, and without that weird Iggy Pop upper body. At the end of the day, get what you want. A sling's like a high school diploma. I don't care where it's from, I just want you to have one, and I'm pretty sure most of you don't. Another important thing I didn't know I wanted was the bolt release lever on the 1301. It comes with this fantastic bolt release lever for totally free after you spend $1,500 on buying the shotgun. But it's still $500 cheaper than the Benelli M4, yet this bolt release is so much better than the cute little button on the M4. When you're completing a tactical reload, it really makes a difference and it keeps your eyes downrange instead of looking at the ass end of your shotgun trying to figure out what to poke at. If you're running a semi, I say upgrade your bolt release to something like what I've got here on the 1301. The last piece of gear that I'm gonna talk about is probably the least important, optics. I used the Burris Fastfire 4 and I was mostly happy with it. The good, it's got almost six years of battery life constant on at mid-level. 
The auto brightness feature works pretty well. It's waterproof and it weighs only an ounce and a half. Pricing is $350 street, which is right in the middle of the road for these. It's also durable as shit. It withstood over a thousand rounds of 12 gauge without so much as shifting zero. The bad side is that they make this awesome protective metal cover, like this little shroud, that cost like an extra 60, 70, 80 bucks, something like that. Um, which is a little bit of a bummer that you have to pay extra to get that protective cover. But the good news is this thing's already pretty tough unless you put the roof on it. So they've got this little plastic roof right here that kind of slides over the top and it makes the gun look like it's sealed like the Aimpoint Acro or something. And that's so hot right now. I get it. But it isn't even worth having. Don't install it. On day one, it was either the cold or the melting snow or both. They got to it. So some moisture got into this optic and it caused the objective lens, the inside of the objective lens, to completely fog up and it was totally unusable because it completely dispersed my reticle. Now again, I don't know if that was like melting snow getting in there or if it was because this is not actually airtight or watertight and then you had oxygen in here. That was a different temperature than the exterior oxygen, therefore it fogged up. But look, the important thing is it fogged up, it sucked. Um, and it was because of this roof thingy. Now the good news is that I fixed it the next day when I accidentally broke the, the uh, rear lens of the roof here. I mean, this, the roof is plastic. I think it's plastic and it did not make it through the second day of the course, but hey, the good news is no more fogging up. Really like this optic. I just would not have installed the roof on it. It's waterproof. It's got good battery life. Really liked the reticle and it was tough and held zero. I'm just saying, if you get it, throw the roof away. I've got so much more to say about shotguns like tactics and the things I learned in Clint's class, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop it short there. I just wanted to talk about my loadout today. That's enough content for one video. I'm going to make additional shotgun content because it seems like you guys are really into it. I'm really into it right now, like it's my thing right now that I'm into. So I'm more than glad to continue to make shotgun videos as long as you guys keep watching them. Speaking of, thank you so much for watching. Thank you to our Patreon and our Subscribestar supporters. Guys, we give away four guns a month and four $100 Blue Alpha Gear gift certificates. If you're a member at the five or $10 level on Patreon or Subscribestar, you're automatically entered into those drawings. That's all I got for you today, but like I said, stay tuned. More shotgun content coming your way. Please subscribe, take care.